Four months after the third supply set sail, Samuel Argall returned to London and reported that the sea venture hadn't arrived in Virginia. He hadn't been a part of the third supply, he was just an independent captain, so the company hoped that the ship had just been delayed. It didn't look good, though, and worse, he brought back a letter from Archer discussing how horrible the situation in Jamestown had become. It was the last letter that Archer would ever send to England. You're listening to the American History Podcast with Sarah Tungsalvola, the show exploring who we are and why by tracing American history from the 17th century to the 20th. A few weeks later, Francis West's mutineers also started arriving in England bringing reports of starvation and a man who had eaten his dead wife. Some of the surviving ships from the third supply also started to trickle in, bringing nothing but bad reports and confirming that the sea venture really hadn't shown up. The Virginia Company's biggest mission had turned into its biggest failure, and all of England now got to experience the kind of disappointment that Virginia's early investors had dealt with. They started to abandon Virginia and withdraw their money, and Virginia again was on the verge of collapse. Lord Delaware tried to slow the panic by announcing that he personally would go to Virginia to lead it on the next voyage that they could fund, but that didn't happen for almost a year. Two more third supply ships returned, one bringing the unruly youths who the colony wasn't healthy enough to sustain, and the other brought a furious and badly injured John Smith. It had been a slow voyage home, and two more third supply ships had sunk on the way. Confidence collapsed. The company had been at a public visibility high, and now it had its biggest disaster. They lost new investors and old alike. To try to mitigate the damage, the company plastered a broadside around London, saying that the people bringing back bad reports were lying to cover their own bad behavior, and that the Royal Council was preparing a mission to be led by Lord Delaware to stabilize the colony. It also announced that the company would screen all future participants, only allowing honest, skilled workers in the most sought-after trades to go. This was a drastic change of marketing tactics, definitely a desperate measure for a desperate time. I'd say that the comedic relief here is that because of some bizarrely inaccurate information from an Irish sailor, this is the point at which Philip became most concerned about Virginia. Without Cecil informing him of the colony's every move, the Spanish king became convinced that Virginia was thriving, that Wahoon Seneca had converted to Protestantism, that he'd been coronated, and that the English had found a bunch of secret mines as well as being optimistic about finding a passage to the Pacific, in addition to Argyll's fast northern route across the Atlantic. Precisely two of those things were true, and one had been ridiculous to the point of humiliation. Meanwhile, Spain's presence in Florida was weakening, so... Worried about England's increasing power in the region, Philip sent Don Diego de Molina and Francis Lembry to take a ship to Virginia to assess the situation and see what would be needed to keep it from getting out of control. When Delaware got to Virginia, he was able to send a promising letter back saying that they'd found the Sea Venture colonists, that most of the colony's survivors had been brought back to good health, and that the colony was progressing nicely. If Smythe was relieved to hear this, he was wrong, because soon Delaware returned to England, which threatened to be the beginning of another fiasco. Worse, Delaware had left George Percy in charge, the man who'd been president during the starving time and who many in England blamed for it. Fortunately, Smythe could assuage investors by telling them that Thomas Dale had already set sail when that happened, and soon Gates also returned to Virginia with his whole family. Then, Smythe made Delaware account for his desertion and published his defense. That was a crisis averted, but the next problem was already emerging. Virginia was starting to face competition for investors. King James had started selling aristocratic titles to raise money, which meant that James and Virginia were now competing for the same investors, and while the Virginia company couldn't promise immediate wealth, An aristocratic title bought immediate political influence in the House of Lords. 
This prompted multiple investors to threaten to default. James also made Newport the master of the Royal Navy, taking his attention away from Virginia. Newport started sailing for the East India Company and died off the coast of Indonesia a few years later. Though the selling of titles was hurting Virginia, the king's financial problems also had an upside. They paved the way for more political reforms. The company leveraged its political influence to push for a new charter. Sands' rebel MP supporters now comprised a large portion of the company's investors, so when he wrote the new document, it took on an even more political tone. There would be even wider public participation, freer trade, and now the Virginia Company would be under the control of one big assembly of all shareholders and participants, with everyone getting an equal vote regardless of share, and the king's powers of oversight were to be completely eliminated. There would be no oath of supremacy, so anyone at all could become a shareholder. The Virginia Company also applied for control of Bermuda, a place which was gaining popularity after Summers' nephew returned with tales of its beauty and fertility. Shakespeare wrote The Tempest, and people wanted to pursue colonization. The islands could be either an asset or a source of further competition, so they submitted a request for the new charter to include Bermuda. In this charter, the company also got the right to hold a public lottery, which was a huge deal and the source of lots of parliamentary debate. Thomas Wentworth, the Earl of Strafford, was actually one of the leaders of the opposition to Virginia's public lottery. If the last charter had been politically charged, this one was a downright threat to royal prerogative. Cecil was dying, though, and he was too sick to stop it from passing. One of his last actions was to organize the exchange for Molina for English prisoner John Clark and to authorize the man making the transfer to renounce the Virginia plantation, recognizing the Spanish right to North America. Cecil's death stopped that last part, though. Cecil's death did postpone the lottery, and to prevent bankruptcy in the intervening time, the company sold assets, starting with Delaware's ship and ending with Bermuda. Within a few months, the Virginia company had to deal with an even more devastating death, because in November of 1612, Prince Henry suddenly died. By the age of 17, Henry had come to be the hope of both the country and the company, England's perfect Protestant knight. Henry's death left the future of the company in danger, and with Cecil also dead, it also created an influence vacuum, which opened the way for faction fighting over the company's future direction. Henry's guidance had been stable and rarely questioned, but now people emerged wanting to mold and use the colony for their own purposes. The strongest of these was a man named Robert Rich, one of the wealthiest men in England, a Puritan merchant trader who had bought the title of Earl of Warwick from King James for £10,000. Warwick wasn't interested in Virginia's commercial prospects. In fact, he'd only bought a single share in the company, which was the minimum to have an equal say in colony affairs. He couldn't care less what was produced there or what kind of return that people got on their investments. He bought a ship called the Treasure, made Argall the captain, and made it openly available to the Virginia Company. Warwick was a trader, and more importantly, he was a leading member of the War Party, a group of nobles and senior gentry actively working to end James's appeasement of the Spanish. That's a nice way of saying a group of Puritan vigilantes actively trying to provoke war with Spain. Warwick saw an opportunity for Virginia to play exactly the kind of role that Thuniga had feared, a base for piracy against the Spanish. Warwick's treasurer was the ship that would take the first black servants to America, and Argall did help Warwick do privateering with it. First, though, it brought Gates, Dale, Merlina, Rolf, Pocahontas, and Virginia's first tobacco back to England, which helped keep up some interest in the lotteries. The company commissioned some cheap pictures of Pocahontas to show and sell, 
and sent Pocahontas and Rolf on a tour of the taverns and theaters of England. This was controversial because some people criticized this as unfit treatment for a princess. More fitting for a princess, though, Pocahontas met the queen multiple times while Rolf wasn't high enough ranking within England to accompany her. Her visit ended with her attending the royal family's Christmas festivities as a guest of honor. Even with Pocahontas' tour, though, the lottery barely paid the colony's old debts, and to make matters worse, Pocahontas suddenly died. Soon, so did the Earl of Warwick, but he was replaced by his son, who inherited his title, his money, and his politics. Henry and Cecil had died in 1612, and it was now 1617. The political rift in the company had been growing for five years, but attention had been focused on the third charter, the lottery, parliamentary negotiations, Bermuda, and other things. Three distinct factions had emerged, though, each with its own leader. Thomas Smythe wanted a politically neutral business, like Smythe's East India Company. Edwin Sands wanted a bastion of parliamentary control outside the reach of the king. Warwick wanted a piracy base that would provoke war with Spain. Smythe saw his influence waning, and his priority became protecting the investments of his associates. It was for this reason that Smythe set up the magazine, a trade monopoly which gave colonists supplies in exchange for tobacco, and which led to the increase in smuggling in 1619. Argall criticized this policy, and Smythe pointed out Argall's own corrupt actions, which included diverting company supplies for personal use and using the colony as a base for piracy, as Warwick wanted. Still, Smythe decided to step down. Smythe had led the company since its inception, and he was the man behind its survival in many ways. So his decision meant that the influence vacuum had turned into a full-fledged power vacuum. It was the beginning of the end for the Virginia Company. The two main candidates to replace Smythe were Edwin Sands and Robert Johnson. Johnson had been Smythe's closest ally, and he planned to continue Smythe's politically cautious style of management. He just wanted the colony to operate well enough to return an investment. Sands was the leader of the rebel MPs. Smythe's faction worried that Sands would use the Virginia Company to advance his own political ambitions, possibly even turning the colony into an independent commonwealth under Parliament. Thanks in part to the Earl of Warwick's support, Sands won the election by a landslide, and members of his faction, including Nicholas Farrar, won elections for essentially all the other positions in the company. Initially, though, he kept his politics largely out of company leadership. His first order of business was recruiting settlers. This was the boomtown era, and colonists needed as many workers as they could get. More workers, more money, simple as that. He recruited undesirables to send to Virginia en masse and encouraged the well-to-do to contribute to the cause. The city of London even started involuntarily shipping children to Virginia, and this action was actually very popular. One man called it one of the best deeds which could be done because it would rid the city of them, give the company a supply of young laborers, and help them learn useful skills. Hundreds were transported over the next five years. Sands also ended the monopoly of Smythe's magazine. The magazine was unpopular, damaging, and Sands himself had taken the lead in fighting against monopolies in England. So it wasn't a surprising act, but Johnson interpreted it as an act of provocation, and tensions between Smythe and Sands's factions escalated to the point of violence. Smythe was out and Sands was in, but Sands was being cautious and not behaving overly politically. That brings us to faction number three. The new Earl of Warwick was completely out of control. His actions weren't measured, cautious, or even focused. 
He was pillaging and plundering indiscriminately. He plundered a Portuguese vessel taking slaves to Mexico and thereby sent the first Africans to Virginia. And at one point he'd gotten so out of control that an East India Company vessel had been forced to intervene in his plundering activities and impound his ship. Warwick demanded financial compensation from Thomas Smythe, but was unsuccessful in getting it. He was furious, and it was largely in retaliation for this confrontation that Warwick had strongly supported Smythe for treasurer, fueling his massive victory. When Warwick saw the, re- when Warwick saw the results of the election, his perceived political influence made him even bolder. Soon, he was out privateering and pillaging in the heart of the Spanish West Indies. He ran a very high risk of successfully pushing England to war with Spain, and to say that he was a political liability for Virginia would be a massive understatement. If either James or the Spanish ambassador heard about Warwick's activities, it would mean the end of the colony. So, just a few months after accepting Warwick's political support, Sands reported his activities to the Privy Council and gave them documents showing that both he and the colonists disavowed Warwick's activities. James already didn't like Sands, and his last-minute distancing of Warwick didn't help his cause. It really just showed that Sands was willing to ally with people even more radical than he was to achieve his goals. So in the next election for treasurer, James demanded that the company only select among five names, all of which were members of Smythe's faction. The battle between King and Parliament had spilled over into a new battlefield, and the company was facing a dilemma. If it selected someone other than James's choices, it would be openly disobeying the king. If it selected a name from the list, it would be effectively giving up its right to free elections. They didn't want to back down, but they also didn't want open confrontation. So they decided to postpone a decision until the next meeting and appointed a small group of people to negotiate with James in the meantime. Sands would continue in his post until they figured everything out. In response to their pleas, James proclaimed, Choose the devil if you will, but not Sir Edwin Sands. Sands knew it was hopeless and arranged for his close ally, the Earl of Southampton, to succeed him. Southampton is a fairly interesting person. He had been imprisoned and sentenced to death after the Essex Rebellion, but when he took the throne, King James had let him go. James was his heir's godfather and namesake, but he'd also sent Southampton to prison briefly following a fight between Southampton and former Essex opponent Anne Gray. Southampton was a dedicated patron of the arts and a tireless political agitator. James was politically astute, though. And as much as the Virginia Company didn't want open confrontation with the king, James didn't necessarily want Virginia to be the issue which provoked a dangerous political confrontation either. The Thirty Years' War was brewing, and his pacifism and proposal to marry Charles to the Spanish Infanta made him more unpopular than ever. Seventy-nine members of the Virginia Company sat in Parliament, meaning that about one in seven MPs were in the Virginia Company. So, at the next meeting, James allowed a free election, and Southampton won easily. James had just backed down, and Sands enjoyed extreme popularity in the company, so this was a perfect moment for him to start imposing his beliefs on Virginia. He started to describe the colony as a commonwealth, which was a blatant challenge to James's belief that it was a crown possession beyond the scope of parliamentary authority. He also arranged for his close friend and in-law, Francis Wyatt, to become governor of Virginia, and he started to draft the new charter, which would solidify the colony's political reforms. In addition, the Virginia Company became a place from which parliamentary opposition to the king was organized and spread, 
Regular meetings of 15 MPs at the Earl of Southampton's house, led by Sands, were at the heart of this activity. James now called the company a seminary for a seditious parliament. James still needed money, and he wanted to raise taxes, but Parliament's opposition was more organized than ever. James decided that if the Virginia Company was going to be used in such a directly political way, he would attack it directly. For that, he sent his Secretary of State, George Calvert, a man who had been a member of the company since 1609, and the man who would later go on to found Maryland. In terms of political allegiance, it's worth noting that Calvert was Wentworth's closest and longest term political ally, and really one of Wentworth's few allies because Wentworth had a reputation for towing a moderate line based purely on legal fact and not allegiances or ideology. Calvert, and especially Wentworth's longest term and bitterest political enemies, were the Earl of Warwick and John Pym. That's just interesting to note for future discussion. Calvert argued that Parliament had no jurisdiction over the colonies, which were the king's direct possessions by right of conquest. Sands countered that under the royal charters, the land was held privately by the company like any other property in the kingdom, which gave Parliament jurisdiction. Tensions were getting too high for comfort, and it was clear that Parliament wasn't backing down, so Calvert announced that James would dissolve Parliament in a week unless they agreed to raise taxes. In response to Calvert's announcement, Sands gave the most famous speech of his career. He raged at the government's failure to support the Huguenots at the corruption of trade by monopolies, about economic stagnation and about how farmers were being driven into poverty, a couple weeks later, Sands was arrested on dubious charges. His stuff was searched, and the most incriminating paper they found was a letter to Amsterdam Brownists trying to recruit them to go to Virginia. The man that Sands had addressed the letter to would ultimately help to organize the Mayflower expedition, along with some of Sands' other colleagues. Sands' arrest pushed tensions so dangerously high that James was forced to make some concessions to Parliament. He really needed money, and a huge portion of Parliament was now convinced that he had illegally arrested their political leader. So, James released a group of prisoners, including Sands, and also John Pym, who had been briefly arrested, as well as George Percy's brother, the Earl of Northumberland, who had spent the last two decades in the Tower following the gunpowder plot, and whose finances were now destroyed. It was a good way to release Sands without raising the issue of whether or not he'd been illegally arrested. Releasing the prisoners marked the end of James's attempts at open confrontation with the Virginia Company, but he wasn't backing down either. He wasn't going to accept an increasingly organized political opposition. If the Virginia Company wouldn't get in line, he would take it over. This is an example of the political maneuvering that James did, which Charles really couldn't. And it's one reason that James kept the peace, despite having more extreme ideas than his son, while war broke out under Charles. First, James banned the lotteries, depriving the company of its main source of income. He also let their charter expire, meaning that he could now collect exorbitant customs duties on anything imported from Virginia. Then he commissioned Fernandino Gorges to lead a revived Northern Virginia project so that Northern Virginia would now compete with a floundering Virginia company for investors. In other words, Virginia now had virtually no way to raise money. At the next quarterly meeting, James gave the Virginia Company one last chance to compromise and continue to exist as an independent entity. He sent Calvert to ask the Virginia Company very nicely, emphasizing that he didn't want to interfere with the company's choice 
but to please consider one of these five nominations for the post of treasurer. These weren't overly political people. They just weren't overt enemies of the crown. No one connected to Smythe's faction was on the list. James was just asking very nicely for the company to meet him halfway, and the shareholders held a vote of thanks to James for his tone. Then they reinstated the Earl of Southampton and Nicholas Farrar, and Southampton gave a speech saying that James's concession offered them greater hopes than ever of creating a flourishing commonwealth in Virginia. Clearly, they weren't interested in compromise. James announced his offense not only at their choice of treasurer, but also at the fact that they hadn't made progress on any of the commodities that he had supported, like silk and wine. And soon, John Martin submitted a petition to the company for 80 square miles of land in Virginia to become a royal forest, which Martin would manage on James's behalf. The land that he applied for just happened to be in the exact location of Jamestown itself, meaning that the proposal would turn the colony's core and capital into the personal property of the king. James didn't want this, but it put the Virginia Company in an awkward position of having repeatedly denied simple requests by the king. First, they'd neglected to pursue ventures that he had invested in. Then they'd rejected his politically neutral treasurer candidates. And now they were denying him a royal forest in a land that was filled with forest. The company tried to minimize the damage by saying that John Martin had ruined his own land in Virginia and wasn't fit to run a royal forest, but it didn't look good. Then, James's Lord Treasurer noted that the Virginia Company could solve all its financial woes by applying for a monopoly on tobacco imports. This was, again, Awkward because Sands had led the opposition to James's royal monopolies, which had been pretty damaging to James. So Sands had to choose between bankruptcy and hypocrisy, and furthermore, he had to apply for that monopoly from the king, whose olive branch and royal forest application he had just rejected. Sands was politically cornered. He applied for the monopoly and prepared to enter extremely delicate political negotiations with the king whose enemy he had so actively been for 20 years. You can imagine that the negotiations weren't likely to stay solely on the topic of Virginia's right to export tobacco. It didn't seem like Sands' position could get any weaker, but apparently it could. It was at this precise moment that settlers started to arrive from Virginia with news of a massacre that had killed a quarter of the population in one day, and the possible collapse of the colony as the rest of the settlers were beginning to starve. So, episode before last, if you were wondering what the Virginia Company was thinking, sending the kind of response it did to the colonists, now you know. They had no money, they were politically cornered, and they were entering political negotiations with James where they faced a massive defeat, not only losing control of the company, but a significant amount of political power within England. Now they had to go out yet again and try to assure the world and the shareholders that Virginia wasn't on the brink of collapse and that their leadership hadn't caused the current crisis. Smythe had blamed the colonists for their woes to try to maintain London Company stability, and Sands borrowed the strategy. Then he commissioned a book spinning the attack in a positive light, calling it a bloodletting which would ultimately make the colony stronger, trying to incentivize people to go to Virginia, and hearkening to the colony's Elizabethan roots, romance, and adventure. Most importantly, the book used the word massacre, which, after the St. Bartholomew's Day and Fort Caroline massacres, had acquired deeply Protestant connotations, the way that Holocaust today has Jewish ones. The tactic actually worked, and for the first time in its two-decade history, Virginia became a symbol of national pride. And between England's recession, national and Protestant pride, 
as well as some involuntary recruitment. Within a couple of months, Sands could boast that hundreds of people were ready to leave for Virginia, along with some arms from the Tower of London which weren't useful in modern combat, but which might help against the Powhatan. It was a minor victory, but Sands's company was collapsing around him. It faced financial collapse in England, Powhatan-induced collapse in Virginia, and now the shareholders had started to abandon Sands's leadership. He couldn't find a way to get through the tobacco negotiations, so those were also paralyzed. Enter the Earl of Warwick. Sands's late distancing of himself from Warwick's reckless piracy hadn't been enough to win James as a friend, but it had been more than enough to gain Warwick as an enemy. Warwick had been waiting for a chance to get back at Sands, and now he had it. So, while Sands was engaged in desperate damage control, Warwick commissioned a report painting the worst picture that anyone could imagine of the state of Virginia. I mean, it actually managed to exaggerate the problems, and it said that if they weren't addressed, the colony would become known as a slaughterhouse and would be a source of national disgrace. Warwick submitted that report to James, and then he turned around and released to the public a massive volume of meticulously gathered documents, letters, and papers documenting the company's troubles. He'd even gotten a hold of Edwin's brother's private correspondence. He laid all the blame on the Virginia Company, meaning Sands. Suddenly, James decided not to go through with the tobacco negotiations after all, and instead he created a royal commission ordering the company's directors to surrender every single document relating to the company's activities. All the documents relating to the Smythe era mysteriously disappeared soon after being delivered. Then the company sought written testimony from anyone who had been in the colony. Only one person's submission survives, and that man is John Smith. Smith had always been critical of the company, and he'd never been one to mince words. And in addition, his hostility had turned personal just a few years before when the company had refused to compensate him for his service or to send him back to Virginia. It was gloves off, and Smith bluntly stated all the problems with the Virginia company. Then he said the thing that James was dying to hear, and it was likely at least somewhat true. The biggest problem was that the company was now owned by more than a thousand shareholders, whereas it had started with six patentees, and because each shareholder had an equal vote, there could be no decisive leadership of the company. The company was too broken to fix, so James should dissolve it, fire everyone who was involved, and then send a squad of soldiers and laborers to Virginia to fix the mess. You could pay for all of that with a two-penny pull or chimney tax. Sands had lost, and the damage that Warwick's actions had done to his leadership pushed the two factions into confrontation so intense that James had to put multiple people under house arrest to prevent violence from breaking out in the streets, and this was after there were multiple vicious public confrontations. He couldn't keep them under arrest long. He was just trying to take the violent edge off the conflict, but it didn't work. At a meeting of Bermuda investors, Warwick challenged one of Sands' supporters named Cavendish to a duel, and they were actually going to go to Holland to do it. James had Cavendish arrested en route and sent a royal command to Holland to get Warwick. The violence wasn't going away, though. James had everything he needed to rescind the charter, and by this point he could also say he needed to do it to minimize bloodshed. Sands petitioned Parliament for help, emphasizing the higher nature of the colony and asking that Parliament at least hear the grievances and oppressions that the colony had suffered, but three days later James sent Parliament a very respectful but deeply threatening letter warning them not to consider Sands's petition. Sands's petition 
The days of Virginia as a bargaining chip were done. Either they confronted James on the issue once and for all, or they backed down once and for all. Virginia wasn't worth the fight when there was so much else at stake. A month later, the Virginia Company was dissolved, and James made the tobacco trade a royal monopoly. Smythe and Johnson were appointed to help manage the company, and James prepared to take away some of the governmental freedom that had evolved under Sands, like the Virginia Assembly and House of Burgesses. In a few months, James died, though, and Smythe soon followed him. Virginia sent a delegation to negotiate the right to keep its elected government, and James's heir, Charles I, agreed. Charles also said that he wouldn't use Virginia as a diplomatic or political bargaining chip. The first Republican government in America had been protected, Charles had won Virginia's loyalty, and under his leadership, the colony could now grow. Virginia as a royal colony was now useless to the political aspirations of Warwick's faction, and he and his allies, including John Pym, started to look elsewhere to plant a new world colony. They started with the Providence Island Company, but soon moved on to Massachusetts Bay. I mentioned the English Civil War, and here's the interesting thing. The Sands and Warwick factions took opposing sides in the war almost to a person, or more accurately, to a family. They were briefly united in the first three years of Charles's reign as Charles let the Duke of Buckingham wreak havoc in England. But by the first year of the English Civil War, the factions were perfectly divided. Smythe's faction had always been apolitical, and they remained largely apolitical, leaning royalist. That was also the approach taken by the East India Company. Calvert remained a royalist, and after an initial confrontation with Charles, his long-term ally, the Earl of Strafford, of course, did too. Sands and his faction, though, gradually became some of Charles's bigger supporters. Edwin's brother, George Sands, became one of England's best-known poets under Charles's patronage, and their family eventually became very dedicated to the royalist cause, as did Cavendish. Southampton ended up being a military leader under Charles, dying serving him in the Low Countries, and his heir initially supported Parliament in the English Civil War, but quickly became a major royalist leader. The Ferrar family was one of the ones who hid Charles after the Battle of Naseby. On the other hand, Warwick and his allies opposed Charles much more strongly than they'd ever opposed his father. And Warwick was such a central figure to the parliamentary side that after the war ended, Cromwell gave him control over English America. But we'll get to that. Thanks for listening. If you have any opinions, thoughts, or theories about anything we've discussed in the show, I'd love to hear from you either on Facebook or Twitter. And you can find those links at the website, AmericanHistoryPodcast.net, as well as links to firsthand accounts and things. See you next week.